morning. It is still morning. Um, today uh, we're going to be taking communion, so um, uh, we're going to we're going to be in Luke chapter twenty-two. We're going to start with verse 7. And this is uh, dealing with uh, Passover, and then it, Jesus transfers from Passover to communion. Uh, takes a very, couple of the very articles from the Passover feast and applies them to another memorial service that would be a memorial service for us. Uh, he would say, in remembrance of me, um, but uh, that's, um, uh, but he first is going to eat a traditional Passover feast with his disciples. And uh, so we're gonna go through that what that entails and then hopefully we'll we'll see how that applies to our own lives in the new covenant what Jesus had had done for us has done for us past tense um, so if you're with me in verse 7 chapter 22 of Luke it says then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed uh, when you read in your Bible and it says the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that's synonymous with Passover. Um, it was a week-long event, and the Jews call it the, the Unleavened Bread, but it, the, the high day of that whole season is Passover. Passover is the high day for Israel because it was their redemption, their redemption from Egypt. So... Um, so when you run across the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it is that season, and it, it breaks up into a, uh, a couple of different feast days, if you would have it. So uh, Feast of First Fruits is three days after Passover, um, and that is the day of the resurrection, and uh, that's what it's actually speaking of as a harvest. And so just, just to give you a little bit of background. So um, anyways, uh, when the Passover must be killed, in verse 7, and he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. So they said to him, Where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man, will, uh, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. Now, just to, to you know, you, if guys carried pitchers of water, how would you know which one it was? But men did not typically carry pitchers of water. So this guy was obvious. Um, so that's kind of what you need to understand about this was guys just didn't do that. Um, you know, uh, they didn't carry water in pots. So this man would be very distinct. Um, then you will say to the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished upper room there make ready. We have no idea who this guy was. I have no idea. I don't find it in the scripture. I mean, there's a lot of speculation on who it would be, but it's obviously something that Jesus had already prepared. He had already talked to this guy. I don't know about the guy with the pitcher. Obviously he had, you know, a word of knowledge there or whatever. 
But as far as the guy with the other room, upper room, uh, the guest room, he, he would have had to have uh, uh, had some discourse with this man to have that room prepared. Um, so, uh, verse 13, so they went and found it just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. Um, now, I'm going to throw something out at you because scholars, Bible students, pastors, teachers, nobody knows quite how to put this. How was Jesus able to eat the Passover and yet be sacrificed on the Passover? That's kind of a, it's always been a question mark. And one of the things that you um, will find in all of the Gospels is there's no mention of a lamb at the meal. None. And the, the Jewish day went from sundown to sundown. You know, at sundown, the, the day changed. So, um, so Jesus might have eaten at sundown at the beginning of the 14th, and the Passover would have been killed at twilight at the end of the day. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's quite possible there was no Passover lamb for their meal. They had all the other different things that were there, but there was no lamb. And so many say that's why, you know, he was, he was, uh, it was Good Friday. You know, that's why the, you know, the speculation on how all that came about um, was that he actually ate it 12 hours or, or more before he, he celebrated Passover, and it was possible for them to do that. Um, so without the lamb, because all the lambs and all the were, were sacrificed at the temple that had become a major t tradition for them. They no longer were, were able to go and, and do it like the first Passover where the father took the lamb and brought it into the house and, and did all that. There, that may have also applied later in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, everything came through the temple. So I just throw that out at you just for information um, that, you know, you'll have somebody, if you do apologetics, you'll have somebody question you on that, and you will have at least a little bit of an answer for that uh, situation. Um, verse 14, when the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Um, Jesus has a passion to do this. Fervent desire is, is passion. And, you know, we wonder, well, why was he passionate to eat Passover? because he was coming to fulfill the very purpose that he came for. It was about over. Oh, he had a day of suffering in front of him, but he was almost over. It's like the baby, when the baby starts coming and you're pushing and you're pushing and you're pushing. Ladies, I never had to push. I watched my wife push. You know, and it's painful, and yet when the baby is born, you're no longer thinking about the pain, you're thinking about the child. You know, and it's the same sort of a thing. Jesus had been walking on this earth for 33 years about that, and the very purpose that he came was to redeem us. And that redemption was going to be accomplished that very day for each and every one of us that would respond to the gospel. And so he has a passion 
for this because you know this is a final meal this is a final deal before I go to um, suffer so there's a, 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 just a fervency about you know sitting down with these guys it's not an end it's a beginning you know it's uh, it's not a goodbye it is you know what I'm gonna do something and uh, it's our redemption so I think that's uh, the way to explain that he says for I say to you I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God so um, let me bring you up to speed because right after this in the next verse it talks about uh, uh, what we call communion it transfers from Passover traditional to communion and he takes a couple of articles from the Passover feast and he applies them to himself he applies them to this new memorial service that they don't get a clue about it until later. And I can't imagine when they took communion after this for those 11 guys. I can't imagine what that was like to look back and have eaten with Jesus and instituted this and they didn't understand it. They were thinking more traditional, we know that. You know, more traditional in the sense of, uh, you know, they, they, they didn't believe that he was a Messiah. Um, not really. Uh, that had yet to hit their heart. John was the first one to believe. And so, um, but uh, just to step back, I'm going to give you, this is rudimentary. This is, not, this is not in extreme detail, but it gives you an overview of what Passover was like for the Jews. Um, first of all, there's a cup of wine. Actually, they would drink wine before this, but there was officially a cup of wine. And the first cup of wine is called uh, the cup of sanctification. It set the meal apart. It set the people apart. It, was, it sanctified this whole event, which they called Passover. So they drank from this cup, each and every person at that Passover meal. They would have a pitcher of, of uh, you know, wine or a wine skin or whatever, and uh, they would either, you know, probably have their own glasses filled up but uh, uh, the point being is this started officially that feast. It started the official point of demarcation or, you know, from, uh, from just being a regular meal. Um, right after that, they would have a washing of the hands. And uh, that was, uh, once again, ritualistic not in a sense of, you know, they, uh, they needed to have their hands washed. They probably washed them before that, knowing that it was going to be finger food and all that stuff. But it was a traditional washing. The next thing that came is they would eat vegetables, quite possibly parsley. And they would take parsley, which is a little bit bitter, and they would dip it in salt water, and it was significant of the, the, the bitterness of what Israel had gone through. Uh, you know, they had, they had you know, um, it's, it's a reminder of where they came from. And all this is a reminder of where they came from in their, their traditions, um, how God delivered them from Egypt. Then they would go and they would pull, and there was three matzah loaves. And uh, most say that's significant for Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, that, that they're, each one of those loaves represents God's provision by himself, and yet in the unity of the triune God. Um, but they would take one of those matzah loaves and they would break it in half. 
and half of it they would put back in the pile with the other two, and the other half they would take and they would wrap it up in a, a napkin or a piece of cloth, and they would go and hide it. If you had children in the house, it would be hidden away. Um, then, after that, they would go back through the whole story of Exodus. Uh, him and I don't compare notes before I come here. We don't, Jonathan and I. He had no idea what I was teaching. I gave him some notes this morning. And there was no way he could have changed his songs or anything else to match or do anything. We don't, we don't do that. Um, so I, I asked him earlier, it's like, he read my notes and he's like, wow, yeah. Just like, I'm wow, you know, why, why are you reading about, you know, and it, and it fits together. But uh, they would uh, tell the story. They would go through the redemption of Israel. Israel is in bondage. They are slaves to Pharaoh and Egypt. And Pharaoh and Egypt, Pharaoh represents Satan and Egypt represents the world system and they are slaves in bondage to the world system and to Satan. In other words, they can't move and he's a usurper, but he has a legal right to hold these people as slaves because they went down into his country and that's just the way that things worked out. And many of us maybe wonder why God just didn't wipe out the Egyptians and let the children of Israel go free. Well, God is legal. And he does everything by a legal standard. God doesn't just do it by sleight of hand. Um, and so legally, God was going to play uh, according to Pharaoh's rules. And uh, guess what? He had to destroy the power of Pharaoh. He had to get Pharaoh to say, okay, I surrender, go free, right? So he had to break his power, his hold over the people. Um, so, you know, you go through the different plagues that came upon, um, you know, the Egyptians started, uh, you know, more as a, a nuisance, but then it got more serious and more serious until he broke their economy. He destroyed every god that they had, and they had a pantheon of gods. Um, and uh, he, he wiped out their gods. I mean, they were frogs, they were the river, they were, those were their, their gods. The last god that they had was Pharaoh's son. Pharaoh's son was in line to be a god because Pharaoh himself was a god. And so we know that at Passover, the Passover lamb, you put the blood on the door, right? And the angel of death would pass over the house and everybody inside that house covered by that blood was safe. Well, none of, you know, we don't know how many Egyptians did it, but we know Pharaoh didn't. And his son died. And Moses warned him. He said, you know what? You won't see me again. You won't see me again. And so the death of all the firstborn in Egypt. I mean, you're talking a lot of kids were taken, even older guys. I mean, it's just firstborn. That's what it said, you know. And, uh, and so God said, okay, you're firstborn for my firstborn. Israel was God's firstborn, right? And so you have this destruction of the power of Satan, Pharaoh, and he does what? Go, go free, right? Unfortunately, he reneged on that, and it cost him his life. Not just the life of his son, but his own life when he 
follow them into the Red Sea, and he's destroyed along with his army. God completely destroyed, absolutely destroyed the Egyptians. The Egyptians would not be a threat to Israel for hundreds of years because he just devastated their economy. They would rise up again because the Nile River was, you know, they, they, were, they were one of the biggest wheat producers in, in the Middle East. So, you know, they, uh, they, they rose again in power, but not to be slave, you know, not to have the slaves of the, you know, the Israelites. And so the Israelites were set free, and when they came across the Red Sea, or through the Red Sea, or under the Red Sea, however you want to put that, when they came up on the other side, they became a nation. They were not a nation before that. They were a bunch of slaves. And so God took them out, and he says, now you are a nation. So he takes this three million people, and he says, you are my nation. Now, he was incubating them in the 400 years that they were there, you know, in the sense of they kept their unity, they kept their language, they kept their, their belief in God, and, but they came out and they became a sovereign nation. And uh, when Jonathan was reading from uh, the Psalm, you know, God destroyed Og and Sion and, you know, gave them their territory and then they entered into the promised land. And uh, just as God would say. So you have this, and I'm spiritualizing this for you, um, you have this, this issue and this is Israel's redemption purchased out of the slave market. That's ex exactly what redemption is. New Testament, Old Testament, taken out of the slave market. Well, I didn't grow up in Egypt, but I did. I grew up in this world. I was born in this world, and I was born with a sin nature. I was as much a child of the devil as anybody else. But God delivered me from what? The power of darkness. He redeemed me. He purchased me out of the slave market. He purchased you out of the slave market. But it costs another firstborn for that to happen. The other firstborn is the Son of God. My only begotten Son. Right? So anyways, they would eat this and they would run through this and they were supposed to remember where they came from. That was Israel's major problem is they, they forgot. Oh, we, we don't ever forget. <laughs> You're right? We don't ever forget. We don't ever, you know, and they forgot. They got in trouble. And they got in bondage again and again and again and again and again. And they were in bondage in the days of Jesus. They were. You know, God was, was still working with them as a nation, obviously. Eleven of the apostles original were all Jews. The 12th was a Jew, maybe the 13th and the 14th, and I'll let you figure that one out. You can do your own uh, homework on that one to see who's called an apostle. But whatever the case may be, um, there was still those who would believe in Israel, the remnant, right? Um, and so they were to remember. That's what this was. That's what Passover was all about. Of all the feast days that Israel had, because they had the Day of Atonement, they had the Feast of Tabernacles, you know, they had three feast seasons, major feast seasons. But the one that was the most important was Passover. 
Because that's the one that dealt with their redemption. That's when God redeemed them. That's when God purchased them out of the slave market and made them his own people and made them into a great nation. And you can see the epitome, the the high point of that was David and Solomon. The empire of, of Israel under Solomon was second to none. I mean, that guy was taking a billion dollars in, in gold, every year. A billion dollars in our, in our market, actually in our market 20 years ago when I did the study on it. A billion dollars. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of gold. And it didn't even include the silver. I mean, the guy had a fleet of ships. He had workers. He built a temple. He had all of this stuff. He had nations around him, had peace with him, giving him gifts. I mean, all the different things that went on. They were at the peak, the epitome. And sometimes we look at Israel, at least I do, and I think, oh, well, they were just a bunch of poor people left. No, they weren't. They were very powerful. They were still very prosperous over the years, even though they sinned against God. God still blessed them. They were still prosperous. But they forgot. And so if they had kept Passover with the right heart, they would have remembered. And they would have come back with grateful hearts. And uh, in some cases, maybe there's a lot of them that did. I don't know. You know, and only, we only have a certain amount of a record. So, um, after the bread and after the telling of the story of their redemption, of what God did for them when he delivered them from Egypt and made them into a nation, um, then there was this other cup of wine. This cup of wine was called the cup of wrath. And at the Passover, nobody drank that cup. Nobody drank that cup at all. They poured that cup out on the ground. Aren't you glad? (laughs) Jesus would actually drink this cup. That's what he told the disciples. Can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? Oh, yeah, we can do that. Remember John and James? No, you can't. You can't drink my cup. Right? Because he was going to take the wrath of God upon himself for our sins. Right? But uh, so this, this, this cup is poured out. Nobody wants to drink it because it signifies what happened to Egypt. Fortunately for them, they didn't have to drink what Egypt drank. Right? Even when the darkness came, it was light in Goshen, right? They were set apart. Even in Goshen, they were set apart from a lot of the plagues that came upon the Egyptians. God made a very clear distinction between the two. So, he goes on, and we'll read this here. Um, Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. Um, For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. So, he takes the articles, two of the articles that are here that are mentioned, I've mentioned them to you, that they're not clearly described in this this text, but... uh, 
First of all, he goes, and the afikamen is what that's called, that, that piece of matzah that was wrapped up and hidden away was taken out. It's a picture. Who was wrapped up in cloths? Do you know what a matzah loaf looks like? Well, it's kind of a little bit like these crackers. These crackers have holes in them, you know. But a matzah would have holes punched in it and it would have stripes on it. What do you think God's telling us? It's a sun. It's a sun. It's a picture of Jesus Christ. And his body was broken for our sake. And he was wrapped up. And so that's the picture of communion. This is my body which is broken for you, right? My body. Now, this is where transubstantiation comes in because some people say, well, it becomes actually the literal body of Jesus Christ. Well, um, in John chapter 10, verse 17, Jesus said, I'm the door of the sheep. Do you believe that Jesus is a door? You know, door. He's a door spiritually, but he's not physically a door, right? In John chapter 6, he already took the whole thing to task because he said, if you don't eat of my body and drink of my blood, then you have no part with me. And everybody's going, oh my gosh, cannibalism. And that's forbidden in the Old Testament law, absolutely forbidden. And then the disciples come away and they say, Lord, it's a hard saying. He said, yeah, I know that. He said, uh, but I'm speaking spiritually. I'm not speaking physically. My words are spiritual. Same thing here. It's spiritual. It is a memorial service. I'm not saying the Holy Spirit can do something unique in this. I, in fact, I pray that he does, that he would touch our hearts through this. But it's not that cracker that's going to do it. The cracker is a representation, right? Same with the wine, which we don't drink wine, but uh, wouldn't be forbidden. Warm wine. Significant of what? Blood. That's why it was warmed up. It was so that they would get a sensory perception of, wow, this is what it cost. This is what it cost. You know, and that's why, you know, we take this, it's representative of my blood. That's what he said, my blood. Do we have buckets of blood that are going to pour down from the ceiling? And, and yet we know that it's by the blood of Jesus Christ that I'm set free. Is that literal blood? Or is it the sacrifice that Jesus made that I accept by faith? It's by faith that I accept these things. By faith. Um, so then there was the third cup. And uh, the third cup is called the cup of redemption. Or as Paul would say, my computer crashed. I was going to look this up and put it in my notes. And I got here and I... I, I, my computer didn't crash. The internet went down. It's been down all, you know. Anyway, so, um, but Paul writes about it, and he said, the cup that we drink is called the cup of blessing. What greater blessing is there than to be saved? That's the blessing. And so that's the cup that Jesus said, this is my this is my blood. This is what I offer to you. Myself. So that you would be blessed. 
And so you have these two parallels. Jesus pulls from the one, but the picture from the Old Testament gives us the picture of what redemption looks like in a manner of speaking. So the third cup is the cup of blessing. So just as Passover was a memorial service, this is a memorial service. We do this in, in remembrance, in memory, right? Just a few days from now, we're going to be uh, celebrating the 4th of July. What is that a memorial of? Yeah. You know how many people don't know that? <laughs> Uh, less and less and less or being able to make that connection because we're just they're 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 sweeping away our history as we speak if we would remember our own history as Americans boy things would be a little bit different but we forget and the world has so transferred some of the things that we should be remembering in a serious manner into what? Just another time to go to Black Friday or some other, you know, sale or some other, you know, we've commercialized the whole thing and never thought about what that really means. You know, Veterans Day, Memorial Day, you know, just the different things that go on. But, hey, okay, that's the way it goes. So, we remember what Jesus did for us, which was our deliverance. I'm going to read you something and ready to close up here. Um, Boaz. How many of you have read the book of Ruth? Okay. There's a guy in there, Boaz. Great man. Um, there's three characters in there by name. Uh, Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. Um, and uh, Ruth and Naomi come back from Moab, which is uh, across the Jordan River. And they come back, and uh, Naomi's husband has died. Uh, her sons have died, which has left Ruth as a, um, a widower and her mother-in-law as a widower. Ruth is a Moabitess, which is uh, um, a cursed person, if you would have it. God said, there will be no Moabite in my congregation, not forever. So how's that? God's in the business of redemption. Faith changes things. It does, you know. And so they come back, she's poor, they're poor. They've been sold into slavery because she had to sell off her property, so they're living in a shanty shack and Ruth has to go out and basically become a beggar. She goes into a field to glean and when they harvested a field, the, the harvesters went before, but they didn't come back and do a second harvest. People could follow behind them and pick up what they could, and they could take it and sell it, eat it, whatever. And so Ruth goes out there into this field that she doesn't even know who the owner is. She goes out into the field, and the guy that owns the field knows about her knows what she's done, and he says to his men, oh, drop a pile of, you know, uh, I think it was barley at that time, drop a pile of barley for her. You know, just leave a whole, and she, Ruth 
you know, stumbles on this whole pile and fills it up, and that's where you get the overflowing, pressed down, overflowing, you know, that's where that comes from. She fills up her, she comes back to, you know, her mother-in-law and says, hey, look what I got. And, you know, and there's this pile, and it allows them to, you know, sell some of it, and obviously to eat. And the mother-in-law goes, what field did you go into? And she tells her, and she says, oh, he's a near kinsman. He's a relative. And then finally, Naomi catches on and goes, ah, God's up to something here. And so uh, Ruth goes and, and, and uses a legal um, means to get the attention of this guy, Boaz. And so he's harvesting the field, and at night he goes to sleep, and she goes down at his feet. She lays at his feet, and he wakes up, and he goes, man, who's at my feet? And then when he realizes it's Ruth, uh, she says, take me under your wing. She, he knows exactly what she's saying. He's, she's saying, marry me. But if you marry me, then you got to buy back the property of my mother-in-law, which is my property also. Boaz said, okay, I'll take care of this. I'll do it. He was willing. He was willing. Though Boaz was a man of wealth and power, he was humble enough to respect a converted Gentile woman and was wise enough to admire her courage, devotion, kindness, and fidelity to Naomi. He considered himself blessed to be wanted by a woman who had uh, who could have gone after younger, a younger man. Boaz's kindness and admiration was so overwhelming that at one point Ruth asked him, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Like many of us, Ruth felt less than she felt that her past, her poverty, and her status as a foreigner in Bethlehem made her less desirable than other women. Yet Boaz noticed her. In Hebrew, the word notice means to acknowledge with honor, to understand. Boaz didn't simply see Ruth. He understood and honored her. He recognized that Ruth was more than her past, or even her present, or her struggles. He honored the woman. She was in his heart, and the woman that she could become with him. God wants us to see Ruth and Boaz's union as an example of how he notices, loves, and redeems each of us. Especially those who feel as though life has ravaged all promise and purpose and left us devastated. That's redemption. But Boaz had to be willing, and it was going to cost him. It was going to cost him having to go redeem the land, and he was willing to do all of that. Anybody ever heard about the treasure in the field? For the treasure in the field, a man went and sold everything so that he could get the treasure in the field? Well... Boaz went and bought the field so he'd get the treasure. The treasure was Ruth. The treasure in the field is us. Jesus sold everything to buy the whole of creation, every bit of it, 
so that he could get the treasure. We are the treasure. We are the treasure. It doesn't matter where he pulled us out of or where you are today. If you are not saved or you're watching on YouTube or whatever, the door is open. It's open. As the one song said, the, the gates of heaven are open wide. But Jesus is the door. That's how you get in. You trust him. You trust him. For those of you who have trusted him, what did it cost? What did it cost for him to redeem us? The high price. He was willing, and he made the sacrifice. He was willing to pay that price for each of us, individually, each of us. Jesus broke the power of sin and Satan over our lives. For those of us who are believers, he doesn't have sway over us. Stand your ground against him. We were once slaves to sin, the world, and the devil. As we take communion, this is us saying thank you, memorial. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. I'm not here to beat on you. God doesn't beat on me. He loves me. But boy, there's something that reminds me that there's times when it just brings me to tears to know where I came from, to know where it, what he redeemed me from. And it's not that he's beating me, and it's not, it's just gratitude. It's just gratitude. So, if I could, yeah. He's on, if I could get a couple of guys to come up and pass out communion, and hold on to it, and then we'll take it together. <laughs>